We're live. Sergeants, uh, if you would uh, begin your recordings. Call out when you're done. Computer recording good. Cloud good. Backup is good. Sergeant Kataski, please take us away. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing joint with small business. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Andrew Cohen, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Today, we are conducting a joint oversight hearing on the city's open storefront program with the Committee on Small Business. Open storefronts allow certain retailers to make use of outdoor sidewalk space to conduct business. I'd like to acknowledge my co-chair of this hearing, Councilmember Mark Joni, chair of the Small Business Committee, and thank him for his work in supporting the city's struggling small businesses. Uh, we are also joined by council members Koo and Kozlowitz. Do I have anybody else so far? Oh, I see Councilwoman Rosenthal with small business. I'll continue to acknowledge people as uh, I figure out that they're here. As we know, the past few years have seen major changes in the retail industry. Online shopping has made it difficult for stores to maintain their storefront presence and across the city, we have seen a rash of empty storefronts in typically high traffic shopping districts. For some retailers, the COVID pandemic has been the final nail in the coffin. Even large department stores have been unable to weather the storm. And in 2020, the city lost or will lose big names like Barney's, Neiman Marcus, and Lord & Taylor. With these large retailers unable to maintain their presence in the city, it is difficult to imagine how smaller stores are able to stay afloat and compete. Somehow, though, many are pushing through, whether it is through mere resilience or determination or pure New York style hustle, the city's small retailers are giving their all to stay open. COVID related restrictions have made this particularly difficult. The tourist market is dried up and most people are working from home and avoiding shopping in person. Even when they can visit a store, inside capacity for retail stores is restricted. In November, small business retail Small business retail revenues were down 35% compared to January. And with, with support from the federal government stalled, it has been difficult for the city to fund comprehensive assistance programs. This is why the committee was encouraged when in late October, the mayor announced the open storefronts program, which allows ground floor retailers and some service providers to use the sidewalk in front of their stores to conduct business. After a successful summer of outdoor dining, it seemed like a common sense to allow, it seemed like common sense to allow retailers the same opportunity. Today, the committees are eager to hear directly from retailers on their experience with the program. We are also grateful that the administration has made time to be here today, as we would like to hear the reasoning for some of the elements of the programming. For instance, I'm curious why the program was not started earlier, perhaps in the summer when people take advantage of the good weather. I'd also like to know why the program doesn't fully extend some of the same permissions as the outdoor dining initiative. For example, we recently amended the, the law to allow rest, restaurants participating in outdoor dining to use outdoor heaters, but this is not permitted for the retailers operating outside. We're also keen to hear how widespread the program is. Outdoor dining has been well received, has been well received initiatives, so much so that we have passed legislation to make it permanent, but the success of outdoor retail is less clear. We hope that we will hear constructive feedback today and implement any needed changes before the program concludes at the end of the year. Before we turn uh, to testimony, I would like to hand uh, the microphone over to Chair Jonai to give his opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Good morning. I'm Councilmember Mark Jonai, Chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our joint hearing today on the City's Open Storefronts Program. I'd like to start by thanking my colleague and good friend, Chair Cohen, for chairing this hearing with me today. Over 65 million Americans have filed for unemployment since the pandemic began. 
The state labor department reported last week that the October unemployment rate in the Bronx was at nearly 18%. By comparison, the unemployment rate in Brooklyn and Queens is just over 13%, while Manhattan and Staten Island have fallen below 11%. This pandemic has left the Bronx not only with the highest unemployment rate of any county in the state, but it also has more than 63% of its residents on Medicaid, compared with an average of 45% in Brooklyn and Queens, 33% in Staten Island, and fewer than three in 10 in Manhattan. With consumer activity having dropped since March, as many Americans have cut back on spending, a recent report by Deloitte found that sales at clothing and accessory stores were down nearly 90% from February through April. In the city, small business revenues are still down nearly 50% in comparison with this past January, and small business retail revenues are down 35%. As small businesses are grappling with decreased revenues, many small businesses have been unable to pay rent and have therefore shut their doors. According to a city control report, over 800 retail establishments have closed permanently between March 1st and July 10th, causing a permanent loss of jobs and wages in the city, as well as tax base. To prevent further closures and unemployment, retail businesses have called for financial relief. Only 43% of retail stores in the city that qualified received a Paycheck Protection Program loan. However, on the city's Employee Retention Grant Program and Small Business Loan Fund provided insufficient and equitable relief across the five boroughs. I was glad to see that SBS recently announced three financial assistance programs available for small businesses in low to moderate income neighborhoods. While I'm uncertain that these funds will be enough to prevent business closures, I know that business owners welcome further funding, and I appreciate the hard work of Commissioner Doris in getting these programs up and running. The city has taken a number of creative approaches to help boost small business revenues throughout the pandemic. While the outdoor dining program encountered a number of regulatory hiccups initially, many restaurants were happy with the opportunity to seat more diners and make more sales. I look forward to hearing from the administration today about whether the mayor's outdoor storefront program has achieved similar levels of success. I wonder how many businesses apply for the program and how many businesses have been able to participate, as well as the outreach and education component of the out of bounds. Additionally, I also look forward to hearing from advocates about the experience of small businesses that have participated in this program, and I'm interested to hear the outdoor storefronts program is providing retailers the assistance this administration promised to give. I fear that small retail stores may soon be a relic of the past. From the rise of e-commerce to big box store competition, consumer behavior changes, and COVID-related restrictions, retail stores are struggling to survive. They need help. They need more than we've given them, and they need it today. With that said, I'd like to thank my Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, Legislative Aide, Austin Sackler, and our Senior Legislative Counsel, Christopher Sartori, our Policy Analyst, Noah Meitzler, and Financial Analyst, Aliyah Ali, for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I'd like to turn it back over to the Committee Council at this time. Thank you, Chair Joni. Um, uh, I just want to make sure I get to uh, acknowledge all the members. Uh, I'm going to take it from the top again. We have Council Member Ku, uh, Council Member Perkins, Council Member Koslowitz, Council Member Yeager, Council Member Lander, and Council Member Brennan. Uh, I'd also like to just take a second to uh, acknowledge the hard work of the staff, the Sergeant at Arms in particular, uh, as well as the committee staff, uh, Balkis Mertig and Elias Serpiak, as well as Noah Mixler and uh, my legislative director, Patty and Trainer. Uh, I'll now ask the committee council to administer the oath. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I believe we've also been joined by um, Councilmember Rodriguez. So I'd like to acknowledge him as well. Excellent. Good morning, Councilmember Rodriguez. I am Balkis Mary, Counsel to the Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify when you'll be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I'll be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist to give testimony will be representing the administration. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participants should written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Testifying first is Commissioner Doris from the Department of Small Business Services. And joining us for Q&A is First Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mallon. And from the Department of Transportation, also joining us for Q&A, will be Rebecca Zach, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Emily Wiedenhoff, Director of Public Space, and Julie Skipper, Deputy Chief of Staff. Before we begin, I'll administer the oath. Commissioner Doris, First Deputy Commissioner Mallon, Assistant Commissioner Zach, Director Wiedenhoff, and Deputy Chief Skipper. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Learn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions. Commissioner Doris? I do. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Mallon? I do. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Zach? I do. Thank you. Director Wiedenhoff? I do. Deputy Chief Skipper? I do. Thank you. Commissioner Doris, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you, and uh, good morning uh, to Chair Cohen, Chair Joe Nye, and members of the Committee on Small Business and Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. As mentioned, my name is John L. Doris. I am the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I'm joined, as mentioned, by Jackie Mallon, our first Deputy Commissioner, uh, Julie uh, Shepard, the Deputy Chief of Staff, Rebecca Zach, Assistant Commissioner of Intergovernmental, and Community Affairs and Emily Wendenhoff, Director of Public Space at the Department of Transportation. It is my pleasure to testify before the City Council today. These are difficult times, and it is my sincere hope that each of you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy. Last week, I testified that our open restaurants program, uh, done in partnership with the Council and with, the in and with industry partners, uh, has been one of our most far-reaching and successful initiatives. To date, the program bolsters over 10,700 participating restaurants. Following this success, four weeks ago, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the Open Storefronts Program, which aims to help small retail businesses rebound during these challenging economic times. This initiative could impact 40,000 establishments and 450,000 employees. And while 70,000 of uh, retail sales occur during the holiday season, the Open Storefronts Program gives customers additional options to shop in person while socially distancing. I was happy to launch our outreach efforts in the Bronx on the very first day of the Open Storefronts Program. The team and I were on the ground in Southern Boulevard, connecting directly with business owners. This included our mobile outreach unit which has provided guidance and resources on site in some of the hardest hit communities of our city. SBS ensures that businesses that are participating in the open storefronts and open restaurants programs understand how to comply with key rules and avoid potential fines through our virtual compliance consultations. Since the onset of the pandemic, we have held over 230 
36 virtual consultations at no cost to businesses. These free virtual one-on-one -on -one consultations aim to clarify existing regulations and help businesses understand common compliance challenges. Through our reopening resources, we have reached over 48,000 attendees. We've hosted over 223, sorry, 233 webinars with a focus on equity of opportunity for all. 84% of uh, entrepreneurs attended our webinars in a language other than English. We have also published plain language industry guides available in multiple languages and are made available on our website. The SBS hotline directly engages and answers small business owners' questions. To date, we have received over 47,300 calls for reopening guidance, outdoor dining, winter assistance, financing assistance, legal services, compliance support, and more. One of the most common challenges we hear when we are in the communities are issues around commercial rent. Our commercial lease assistance program offers free legal services to commercial tenants citywide. Since the onset of pandemic, we've assisted funding. We have increased funding for this program. The CLA program has assisted several hundred businesses, primarily from marginalized communities with their lease related matters. We also partnered with the City Bar Justice Center via their Neighborhood Entrepreneurship Law Project to connect business owners to free legal assistance and support with navigating insurance related claims, contracts, and access to federal relief programs. Last week, I joined the mayor uh, in announcing a 37 million investment in support of small businesses across New York City's low to moderate income neighborhoods. The NYC LMI storefront loan interest rate reduction grant and the strategic impact COVID-19 commercial district support grant will provide critical resources to small businesses to help them build back and grow beyond the pandemic. We know that Black, Latinx, and Asian businesses are struggling with access to capital. These communities have been historically prevented from access, accessing the resources they need and face a higher risk of closing. The launch of these programs is targeted in a targeted approach to provide really uh, efforts in the communities that need it the most. In addition, we also launched a small business Saturday, the Shop Your City campaign, a call for all New Yorkers to spend their dollars locally. Members of my team and I held a five borough tour to encourage New Yorkers to shop locally because we know that for every dollar spent at small businesses, 67% of that dollar stays in the local community. SBS is committed to doing everything we can to support our small business owners and get them the resources they need. Look forward to our continued collaboration with the council on this effort. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to update you on SBS programs and services to assist small businesses. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Doris. I'll now turn it over to questions from Chair Cohen, followed by Chair Jonai. Alice, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. As a reminder, if council members other than chairs would like to ask a question of the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order. Again, we'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Thank you. Chair Cohen, you can begin. Uh, Chair Jonai, do you want to start or should I? No, I'll let you start, Chair. No problem. Uh, Commissioner, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, could you just go over again some of the sort of facts and figures about uh, the number of participants, applicants, uh, if there have been applicants who have been turned down, why, but just sort of the nuts and bolts again? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, the program currently uh, has uh, 563 stores that are participating. Uh, any store that signs up, uh, no one is turned away from the program. So um, you just have to sign up and, and sign the attestation. Um, really, it's a five minute process. Um, and uh, yeah, so we don't turn anyone away from the program. Um, if you want to be involved or included in the program, you can be. Uh, 560, I mean, it, it's not nothing, but it's also relative to the number of retail locations in the city sounds modest. Do you think there are obstacles just getting the word out? What do you think is going on with that? Yeah, I think, um, 
you know, that's uh, certainly a concern of ours. Um, as we saw uh, the program when we launched it a month ago, um, there was some initial excitement around it. You know, there, I think there are multiple uh, issues at play here. Um, one, uh, we know that some of the stores um, are already uh, participating uh, in the program. Um, we also know that um, uh, uh, many of the stores that sort of put their wares out front. And so we, may have, we just have to go around and which we have been doing to just tell them to sign up for the program. So that's just a, an information gap there. Um, and then uh, also, you know, uh, the reality, the harsh reality is that the uh, pandemic, um, uh, we've heard from uh, some of our bid partners, we've heard from uh, businesses as well, that some uh, the pandemic as well has uh, caused a somewhat of a slowdown, the uptick in uh, um, uh, in the COVID uh, trans, uh, uh, transmission and um, in hot zones, et cetera. And so, you know, there's a combination of things going on, I believe, uh, but we've done extensive outreach. Uh, we have uh, literally, as I mentioned, been on the blocks of uh, these where these businesses are. We've talked with them. Uh, we've conducted webinars. We've did trainings. Uh, we've sent out materials. We've worked with our partners. Um, particularly our bid network of 76 bids, 100,000 businesses represented there. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but certainly, uh, we want to get that number up. As, as we know, this is an important time uh, for small businesses. When you rolled this out, Commissioner, what was your goal? What were you, how many, what kind of numbers were you, were you hoping for? Yeah, look, I mean, I think um, we, we had out there that, uh, and I said in my testimony, uh, Mr. Chair, that, you know, 40,000 retail businesses across the city are eligible. Um, and so we are hopeful that uh, those who are eligible will participate, but that's the number. And when we made the program that we made available uh, for those businesses. Uh, can you, uh, there seemed to be a greater sense of uh, immediacy around restaurants. What was, why didn't we uh, try to put this on a parallel timeline as, as the restaurant industry? Uh, yeah, you know, I think on, on, in this aspect, um, when we began to uh, look at this and speak to uh, a lot of our big partners, and we, can, we, we do know that this is the time that our small businesses um, needed, particularly our storefront business, because this is the time that they actually get 70% of their sales. So we want to make sure uh, that we highlight it this time, give them an opportunity to do it during the holiday season last several months of the year is when they make the majority of their sales. Uh, and so uh, we went ahead and did that. And, um, you know, we've got some uh, additional work to do to make sure more businesses sign up. Uh, but I, I, I must say again, the challenge continues to be the uptake in, in, in the virus um, where we're seeing that we're hearing from folks that they're concerned um, uh, about that and uh, add an additional uh, investment um, based on that. Uh, was was there a discussion about using uh, uh, the the roadway, the parking spaces in front of the retail, uh, the same way restaurants do within the administration? Yeah, you know we, you know as as we went through the process, um, you know all things as you can imagine with uh, with trying to figure out a way to save our small businesses, bring our city back. Uh, we've looked at all options, um, but we have uh, you know came to the point where. Uh, you know, restaurants um, were participating with the open uh, streets component of the program. Um, we knew that uh, storefronts can utilize uh, the space in front of, safely utilize the space in front of their, their storefront and uh, found that it was the best option uh, for our uh, small businesses in particular, not having co uh, conflict with, with restaurants and, and storefronts, et cetera. Uh, over that uh, over that space, so found it uh, to be best to do it in, uh, in the way that we're doing it right now, which have uh, the small business storefront utilize the uh, the, ex the immediate frontage that they have in front of their store storefront. Uh, are you concerned that it's a little bit of the uh, sort of a one size fits all solution? I mean, there could be more creative, you know. You know, I, I think this model sort of envisions, you know, taking a couple of racks and putting them out in front of the store. Uh, there might be more creative ways to use the space if retailers had a little more flexibility. You know, and I think that goes to the 
the outdoor heating question and sort of just giving them a little more flexibility. Yeah, certainly um, we, uh, in, in our um, conversations with small businesses, you know, I think the fact that they can easily go outside uh, in five minutes, sign up for a program uh, and utilize the space in front, which as you know, it's unprecedented in process wise as it pertains to how the city does its work. And within five minutes of test, put their wares out front. Um, some of them have gotten you know, a bit creative in how they do that. Um, and uh, to sort of capture the eye of the customer. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's where we, we landed. And you know, it's um, so far, um, we haven't, uh, creativity was, or ease of uh, program is, is not a concern we've heard about uh, from the community at large. Uh, for restaurants, when they were initially rolled out, um, I received a flurry of uh, complaints, frankly, from restaurant owners uh, over um, multiple agencies exercising jurisdiction so that they'd get an inspection from uh, the fire department. There'd be one problem. DOT would come. You know, there'd be a completely different problem. And it was... Um, having these uncoordinated multiple layers of you know, uh, uh, compliance authority was, was really frustrating. And I think that the city has really tightened that up to that where that problem seems to have gone away. Uh, has there been any kind of similar experience uh, in terms of retailers? Um, no, uh, we have not heard uh, of that as an issue. Um, as you can imagine, um, you know, our our role at SBS is really uh, to help with that coordination and, and, and on behalf of small business, be their advocate to the administration as well. Um, and we've worked with our partners, uh, colleagues here and, and, and others around the city uh, to make sure that, um, you know, there's constant communication uh, and that doesn't become a challenge. And we've not heard or seen uh, any such challenge uh, in this particular program in the last few weeks that since we've had it open. Okay, uh, I'm gonna take a pause and turn it over to Chair Jonai and then we'll let the committee members ask some questions and then if I have anything else, I'll come back. Thank you, Commissioner, I really appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Uh, Commissioner, good to see you again. Uh, see you, thank sir. you for all your hard work and commitment. Uh, you, obviously, I, I'm grateful for the application do you have any data on how many uh, store funds did not qualify because they had a, a fire hydrant in front of their location? They didn't have the depth of the sidewalk or they were located in front of a bus stop. Do you have any data on how many small businesses did not qualify for the open streets program? Um, I do not have direct uh, numbers there. I'm not sure if our DOT uh, colleagues do. I mean, we have, uh, again, we, the way we envisioned the program, laid it out, is, is to do it in a safe way, in a way that uh, we can have enough uh, foot traffic, the, the eight feet clearance, and uh, not any obstructions uh, that are there in order to prevent, again, flow of traffic safely uh, while having wares out front um, and, and commerce to be conducted, um, where 40,000 potential uh, businesses can participate. Uh, uh, Emily or, or anyone else want to add on, on the DOT front? No? Okay, sorry. No, okay. no it's okay. We, uh, we, don't have, we don't have that data. Um, the Open Storefronts program is slated to end at the end of the month. The impact of the pandemic obviously is going to be felt long after December 31st. And with the fear of a second wave coming, we're not even sure that those that have participated may be able to continue their operations. Is this program going to be extended past December 31st? Uh, Chair Jordan, I thank you so much uh, for that question. Uh, as you know, the program started October uh, 30th and uh, initially started as a pilot program uh, when it was announced with the mayor uh, up to December 
uh, 31st, the prime time for uh, retail, 70% of their sales. Uh, we're, we're looking at everything at the moment. Um, I don't have an announcement to make today concerning extending, but certainly uh, it's something that we are looking at and reviewing based upon all that you have just mentioned. Um, certainly, um, you know, we have some consistency in our other programs. And so uh, we don't have something to announce today as it pertains to extending the program, but it's something that I'm definitely uh, open to and uh, we are reviewing. Thank you, Commissioner. The idea behind the question, obvious, is so that these small businesses can prepare in a pair. Yeah. You know, we lead them on. They've got a month. They've got four more weeks, hopefully, uh, to the end of the year. They're second guessing whether or not they should make any investment in the creativity of how to market their products, uh, enclosures, and so on and so forth. Um, I would encourage that if we plan on extending this program, that we inform them sooner than later. There's no reason to wait for the last moment. Let them, give them the fighting chance so that they can get creative and make the investments that they need to hopefully recover from this crisis. Uh, you mentioned the $37 million program of which 35 million of it is a loan that has to be paid back. Am I correct? Correct. It requires the business owners to offer a personal guarantee for these loans. Isn't that odd since the city just passed a law banning landlords from more fear, from enforcing these type of clauses? Why would we ask for personal guarantees for loans when we just passed laws that prevent uh, landlords from doing the same? Well, thank you, Chair Joan. I look the the uh, you know we're partner with a with a lender who um, the majority of those dollars are from that partner, um, and those are sort of regular uh, loan uh, procedures uh, that occur when we uh, have small business loans. Um, we certainly hear that as a concern. Um, we are uh, we don't believe that that would be an issue based upon our research with the businesses that are potentially um, able to utilize this program. Uh, and uh, we will monitor it to see if it is an issue, but uh, we, don't, we don't think it will be an issue. Um, and uh, we don't think it's something that's prohibitive for businesses to uh, engage um, in it because it's generally how uh, business loans are operating um, now. And so those businesses go out and get business loan. Uh, when I went and got a business loan, others, you know, it's the same similar, um, uh, similar uh, requirements uh, that they are asked to, uh, to fulfill. Yeah, but Commissioner, <laughs> open and honest dialogue. You'll never know how many businesses won't apply for this loan because they'll read that clause that says you are personally guaranteed. We're coming after your home and every other asset that you don't repay. That was the reason we passed a legislation that protects these small businesses. I understand Absolutely. clearly that this is a practice of uh, when borrowing money to traditional banking. Why isn't the city guaranteeing these loans on behalf of the small businesses? Since you feel that you don't see it being a problem that they're going to repay and that the personal guarantee is going to come into question. Yeah, the city, you know, the city is a, is a, is a member to this. Uh, and so we have a loan loss reserve. If anything is to happen, the city first uh, uh, will, will uh, pay out uh, to the borrower. Uh, and so that, it, that provision is there. And that's the really only reason where um, we were a way we we're able to uh, raise this capital to help uh, these small businesses who, by the way, uh, in these communities, um, you know, from previous uh, programs, and this is why we're doing it in such a targeted way, and uh, certainly from your advice as well, and, and input along uh, these months about how we should go about doing this in a targeted way, um, you know, we, that's what we've done. And, um, you know, we make sure that there's a backstop where the city is. And so we, we're the first loss. We go, then we go to the city first um, to, to help ha handle that, uh, those challenges, uh, if it is to come up. 
So the city investment here is to make sure uh, that it's in it's interest free uh, and that it is uh, uh, any of any challenges. Uh, if there's any loss, we do have a low loss reserve to help uh, facilitate that process for our small businesses. Thank you, Commissioner. When you say targeted, it sounds more like discouraged to me because there are so many more restrictions. Not only the personal guarantee, but business owners cannot have any personal business tax liens or legal judgments for the last three years. These are meant for ways to discourage um, applying for the loans, as well as the personal guarantee on top of that. Any answer? No, other, other than um, I hear the concern. I, I think we'll, we will continue to monitor this. Uh, you know, look, it's um, the city is in the mix. We are there. Um, we are making sure that this is accessible to folks. Um, we did, we, you know, spoke to businesses and our lending community. Uh, this is a product that we feel that will be successful. Um, and we've heard already from business and business community, the, the interest, uh, and we believe that we will get to the businesses we desire to get to with this, uh, um, very targeted fund. And the reason I say targeted is because uh, these LMI communities did, did not get the support from either the federal program, the federal programs in particular, um, it did not, uh, by the count of the Federal Reserve and others, their own admission, uh, that these programs did not get to LMI communities in an effective way, particularly Asian, Black, and Brown communities, um, and also uh, our Latinx communities. So, you know, this is what we, we put together, something uh, to help um, fill a gap that is there. Um, and the businesses uh, that we understand that are there, there there's enough uh, pipeline to actually engage and are able to meet the requirements uh, of the loan. So Commissioner, based on those comments you just made and to fill that gap, you truly believe $35 million is enough for all the small businesses that did not qualify and that are struggling in New York City? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, I, there's no way, uh, you know, we've got a massive challenge here. Um, you know, the PPP program pumped $25 billion into New York City. Uh, and it's still, as you can see, while we're, we're having this hearing, it's still not enough. We need more. We need a federal stimulus. And we've said this over and over again, looking at the city's uh, financial resources, where we are as a city, and also understanding the challenge of the state even and where they are fiscally and uh, knowing that the only entity in, 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 is, is in the, in, the uh, in government right now that can do anything that is substantial is through the federal government. Uh, right now, the HEROES Act is $370 billion, $370 billion for small businesses, $125 billion of those dollars uh, for the Restaurant Act, all sitting on in the Senate uh, it, you know, and, and so we are, you know, we're suffering. Small businesses are suffering. Uh, cities, municipalities, states are suffering um, because of the inaction of the federal government. And they're, they're, that's where we know the resources are. And so I agree with you that uh, we need additional. Also, there's 125 or so billion dollars sitting in the PPP program that is unutilized and uh, by, uh, from the federal government and they will not release those dollars. Uh, the Muni, we call the Muni facility to help help uh, local governments unutilized and looking to be shut down from the federal government. All these are resources that are have made unavailable uh, to us to actually engage in helping small businesses. And so uh, we're hoping uh, that there's uh, the change in administration helps to change in the policy front, Mr. Chair, but you are absolutely right, 35 million is uh, it's a shot in the arm. It's what we have, what we can uh, pull together with our fiscal uh, challenges at the moment and uh, really help as many as we possibly can. Uh, and, and that's what we're, you know, we'll continue to do. Commissioner, there's no argument that that much needed relief and those resources uh, that we need so desperately from the federal government comes soon. But in the meantime, we could do more. We can do more. And uh, again, some of these things are not in your control. But this administration, for example, just proposed that uh, it begin a school bus program and it found $900 million to be able to start its own school bus program. And yet all in, 
we couldn't scrap up more than $49 million from the city in the first round, and now through a partnership, through a loan program of $35 million for over 200,000 businesses. I want to remind you, Commissioner, I know that you're well aware of this fact. Every dollar that we invest into small business has a return. Every small business that reopens and does not close will contribute to our tax base. This is the wisest investment that we can make to assure this city continues to thrive, that it has jobs opening, that it has a tax base. When those small businesses are gone, it's going to cost us a lot more later. So I continue to encourage you to come up with creative ways. And the money that we've thrown into this so far is laughable. It's a joke. We haven't done our part. And we often refer to this city as the partner of small business. They're not their partner. They have treated as stepchildren. We've abused small businesses as the piggy banks and the well that we constantly go to to draw water from. And in their time of need, we weren't there for them. And it's, the facts are in the dollar amounts. And I know, Commissioner, that had you had it your way, that we had a magic wand, we would be given billions of dollars out in grants. But the two programs that you just referred to, the first one at 49 million, and now a 35 million uh, loan program, which has more restrictions than I care to imagine. I can go to a regular bank and I can get the same type of a loan. I didn't have to go through the city. So this is more smoke and mirrors than anything else. Personal loan, personal guarantee, no personal business tax liens, no legal judgments to, to replace the word targeted. I would use the word discouraged. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll pass it back to you, uh, Chair Cohen. Thank you, Chair Joni. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the Committee Council to uh, call on members who have questions, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on Council members in the order that they've used the Zoom raise hand function. You can begin once I've called on you, and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before you're asking your question. First, we have Council Member Koo, followed by Council Member Kostowitz. Oh, I <coughs> Council Member Koo just lowered his hand, or no? no. Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. I just pushed my mill button. Sure, so give the Sergeant a minute to start the clock and you can begin your question. Your time will begin now. Hello? Go ahead, Peter. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairs, and thank you, Commissioner, uh, for coming in to, uh, to inform us about this open street um, shopping or whatever. Uh, I, I think personally, uh, you guys have good intentions, you know, the administration, to help small businesses. But you don't understand the real situation on the street. I mean, in the wintertime, when you put stuff outside, you had to hire somebody to watch it. And then, but, but the, whatever you get from the sales, sometimes it's not enough to pay the salary or the wages for the employee. And very few people want to stand outside during the cold weather. That's why very few businesses sign up for this program. I mean, besides, the, in downtown fashion area, the, the whole street is full of vendors. It's open street, open street, free market every day in Flushing. And there's no enforcement, no nothing. So how could businesses open, like, put their stuff outside uh, to compete with these uh, uh, unlicensed vendors on the streets? When you buy stuff from a store, you have to go in to pay for it. You have to get a receipt, right? So, but when you buy stuff from the streets, from the nice inventory, you just buy it and leave. So you create an um, uneven paying field for, spe uh, for small business owners. Uh, if you don't assign somebody to watch the stuff, um, a lot of stuff will be gone because then lately there's no enforcement. 
And whoever took the stuff away, and even though they are caught by police later, they didn't go to jail. I mean, they come back the next day. So there's no incentive for business, for people to obey the law now. This is open street, wild, wild west. Uh, so that's why this, I don't think this program will be successful uh, unless you change it uh, dramatically. Now, unless you say, you know, oh, uh, there's a, a tax moratorium uh, until Christmas. So anything you buy from the uh, streets or from the stores, there's no tax. Because when you buy stuff from unlicensed Hold on. Uh, vendors, <laughs> there's no tax anyway, right? So Commissioner, have you considered or has the administration considered a tax-free holiday uh, for small business owners uh, when people that buy stuff uh, from the streets. Uh, Council member, thank you for um, for that question. I don't have any uh, uh, info about the tax moratorium proposal, um, but I do hear you on the challenges of um, uh, our brick and mortar and our vendor community. You know, I I was out. I started my um, my um, uh, five borough tour in Flushing. Um, and, you know, did see exactly some of the challenges that you, you're, you're mentioning and some of the uh, uh, vending issues and spoke with the business owners about it and uh, uh, spoke to uh, also a licensed uh, veteran uh, who came up to us to talk about uh, the challenges that he is having in finding space to to actually do what uh, he's licensed to do. I mean, this is a challenge. And so um, we're not ignoring that. Uh, we did uh, talk to our agency partners and hopefully we can continue to work uh, with the community there, uh, but this is a challenge. And so I, I do hear you, I saw it, we are on the ground. Um, been to Flushing several times in particular, um, and we launched again this past Saturday. We started everything there uh, 10 in the morning, uh, speaking to those businesses and uh, seeing the, first of all, the number of uh, folks who are out that early uh, shopping uh, was, was heartwarming. But again, the challenge uh, and the balance, as you mentioned, between the vending community, brick and mortar community, and uh, making sure that uh, everyone understands the rules and parameters uh, is, is important. So how do you solve the challenge? I mean, just you said there's a challenge. The yeah. administration always said there's a challenge. And when you say it's been like four months now, five months now, since you came to Flushing, and I invite you to come again. This whole street is full of vendors. Yeah. And how no, do was... business owners survive? I mean, yeah. they're selling everything under the sun. No, it used to be just they sell like, like a cheap stuff, but they sell clothes, they sell crabs, they sell fish. They sell a box and pans, everything under the sun on the streets. And they are so crowded. It's, there's no social distancing on the streets. There's shoulder to shoulder. And where is the administration? Where is enforcement? Why do pay taxpayers, why do property tax, uh, I mean, the business owners pay tax and there's no protection, no enforcement. I mean, the administration is not doing a good job at all. It's a lousy job right now. I mean, at least you can say, hey, a month from now, we're going to do something. But it has been four or five months on the streets. There's no enforcement. You. you just nod your head. That's it. Yeah. No, no. no I'm acknowledging the concern, uh, Council Member, and I am acknowledging that, uh, you know, we're not an SBS is not an enforcement agency. We do coordinate uh, with the uh, enforcement agencies around the concerns, and we do convey it. I mean, so, um, and you know, we certainly uh, would love to, to work with you again um, and continue to do so to help address this issue um, in Flushing in particular. I, again, I, you know, Saturday I was there and saw it for myself walk on the ground. Uh, and and I, I heard from the community, we've heard um, and uh, we've spoken to our colleagues and um, you know, happy to work with you on, on how we can address this going forward. Uh, what about, about uh, uh, on 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 other issues? Like how long you will extend this uh, uh, open street shopping? 
until the uh, end of the month? Yeah, the program is, is uh, concludes at, uh, currently concludes at the end of December. Um, again, we wanted to capture the, the biggest shopping time of the year, which 70% of sales occur, to give an option. It's an option for businesses. Uh, some may choose, some may not, but there's an option. At least they have an option and um, we wanted to give them that option to participate um, up to the end of the year. Yeah, council no, member, Koo, can, yeah. Council yeah, member Koo, I'll give you a second round. I just want to let other members yeah, who have waited, yeah. please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Koo. Now we have Council Member Koslowitz. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Um, how do you notify all these businesses about, let's say, uh, outdoor bringing you goods outside selling them? How do you notify all the businesses? And thank you, Council it's, Member. It's, thank you, Council Member. We have so we have a vast network of uh, uh, businesses in our database, over two hundred thousand. Uh, we do also have our bid associations, which also represents about 100,000 businesses, 76 bids. We also work with our chambers of commerce in each borough uh, who themselves have uh, tens of thousands of businesses that they work with. And we have channels and ways we communicate with the businesses, either if it's on social media or in the media uh, or uh, through direct uh, contact with businesses themselves, either through uh, our hotline when they call in or through our um, emails or uh, different contact list, um, uh, but certainly working uh, specifically with our partners, um, we reach we reach uh, uh, most of the businesses in the city, if not all of them, with this information. Um, because I want I represent Forest Hills and Rigo Park and Kew Gardens, and I have uh, Continental Avenue and Austin Street in my district. Austin Street used to be considered the Fifth Avenue of Queens. Yes. Not anymore. And the other day, as I was walking down the street, I saw one store that had their merchandise outside. Other than that, the stores that are still open in business did not, did not. And I wonder, we don't have a bid here. I've been working, trying to get a bid for, for years. And I just want to know, do these people know that they're allowed to put their wear, you know, merchandise on the street? That's a great question. And, um, you know, um, you know, Austin uh, is one of my favorite places to go shopping. Uh, as you know, I lived in R North Richmond Hill for a long time. It's one of your constituents. And I think uh, part of, part of uh, going back there just recently again um, and seeing uh, that uh, we don't have a lot of our stores uh, participating in the program there um, and the traffic. It's uh, only one. There is only yeah. one store. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, part of, you know, we work with the local uh, merchants associations as well. Uh, to get the word out. And so we believe that businesses know, uh, but we will also do a blitz there um, as well. Um, we'll get our teams to go uh, and do a blitz again uh, in that particular community to make sure that folks uh, know, but we have worked with the Merchants Association as well uh, there. Um, when it was, uh, you know, in 70, 70th, 71st there with the uh, our, our, our restaurant row, um, we did, um, we did a, a press conference there when we, we had not announced um, the open, uh, the open uh, restaurants, open streets program in which we did shut that down, right? Um, and it was, it was uh, very- And that was fine. Yeah, yeah. And so, we, you, know, we, we'll, you know, we brought the attention there, we'll do it again um, as well uh, with this particular program. Um, and and I've been, while I've been there, um, I think a couple of weeks ago, I wasn't able to again, check on all the stores. And so we're happy to do that uh, for you, Councilman. I would appreciate it. And I also, <clears throat> excuse me, have the same problem as Peter Koo has about all these vendors out on the street, streets that they're not supposed to be vending. For instance, Austin Street, you, you're, you're not allowed to have vendors there and they're on every single corner. And nothing is done. Yeah, um, you know what we've done, um, 
as uh, an agency, again, not an enforcement agency. Uh, mm -hmm. We do work with the enforcement agencies to tell them where they are hotspots. And uh, we've reached out and, and our team, uh, we do work with them. We have interagency coordination meetings about how we go about addressing those. And so we'll follow up uh, with them as well on, in, in the Austin uh, Street area as well, as well as uh, council member uh, Coons area in Flushing. Um, and, and get back to both of you uh, on, on an action plan. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor. Chair, if I can jump in for a moment and also add to that list sections of my district and I will, offline, I will send you those areas where we have um, illegal street vending that is in direct competition with brick and mortar and where there is no sidewalk space. There is no five foot space there. We have each day, at a major transit hub, struggling wheelchairs that aren't able to get by. From a slew of open barbecues to anything else imaginable is being sold um, uh, creating a, a concern. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Chair Cohen, do you have- okay. I didn't know if there was anyone else. Are there any other members with questions? Let me turn it back to Council Member Ku. Peter, if you have another, if you have any more, now's the time. I just want to say that, like, I, I know the uh, Commissioner for Small Business uh, has no power of enforcement. Uh, uh, I think he has to convey the message to the administration that enforcement is very important. Otherwise, why would we pay tax, pay tax, pay property tax, pay income tax, pay all these sales tax? Because we want government service. If there's no service, what about we, we cancel the tax? You no, know, they, they're talking about cancel rent. You no, know, we cancel the tax for two months to let the administration know about this importance. So like small business owners in function, they pay one of the highest rent in New York City one of the highest property tax. But in terms of service, there's not, no service at all. I have been talking about this months ago and, and the mayor still hasn't done anything, you no. Know? So the message to the mayor is, you no, know, do something, you no. Know? Just don't open your mouth and talk. You know? I mean, the open streets shopping is, is good, but if there's no enforcement, you put stuff outside, people will take it, disappear. Unless you assign somebody outside to watch it. So that defeats the purpose of open, right? You're supposed to be on the system. You buy the stuff take it, and then go inside to pay for it. But if nobody is doing it, how are they going to survive? Business owners, that's why only 500 people, 500 business owners apply for this program. It's not practical. No. That's, that's all I want to say. I mean, th this message is really important, but administration is not hearing it. They, they are deaf. No. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for letting me the opportunity to, to, to rant about this, yeah. Of course. Uh, I, I, I want to follow up on this just a little bit too. I think this is actually a question for DOT. Um, the program requires eight feet of sidewalk clearance after the additional space that the retailer is using. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yes. yes. But there's no enforcement. It, what, what if, what if to council member Ku's point, what if there's somebody street vending there, then I can't participate in the program because I, I now I can't get eight feet of clearance. I'm not sure if there's someone who has a, an answer for, for the vending, but if the, the vendor's not supposed to be there, then that, that would be an enforcement issue. But there's a, there's a, well, first of all, the administration is declining to make, to do any enforcement in this area, A. And B, it could be the spot could be legal until now this program exists. And now we have the, the, the brick and mortar is competing with the street vendor for the same space. How is that going to, how are those disputes going to get resolved? I don't know. I'm sure if there's anyone from DOT who's going to, wants to jump in. I don't have an, I don't have a direct answer for you right now, Council Member Cohen. I can absolutely follow up, apologies. You, you don't have an answer because the, there is no, there's no policy answer at the moment. And this is a real 
the street vendors are facing a terrible plight. It, 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 you know, the, this needs to be resolved in a way that is equitable and fair to the vendors and to the brick and mortars. Um, and that this has lingered on and dragged on for all this time with no progress. It's really, it's shameful. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that you can hear the frustration in you know, my colleagues' voices about this. I absolutely can. All right. Um, yeah, Chair Cohen, uh, to your point, and just to piggyback on Ku and uh, Kozowitz on these points, what's going to happen is we're going to have a race to who gets there first, and then we can have an altercation between a brick and mortar and a street vendor that can lead to God knows what. Um, and, uh, it's a real concern, Commissioner, that cannot go unaddressed. We need to hear the plan and the policy for enforcement before we have a tragedy that occurs on our city streets. And it will happen. It's happening now, before the open streets program. Now with this in place, the retailers are really going to have an issue uh, with the uh, vendors. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we get ahead of this before uh, we have to be reactive to a tragedy. Thank you. Uh, I really uh, appreciate the administration's testimony um, and uh, thank you for participating. Commissioner, I, I do want to acknowledge, you know, I do appreciate the hard work that you do and the challenges that you face in this incredibly difficult economic environment and, and how important it is, as we all know, that small business really is the backbone of the city. It's said over and over again, but it's, it's very, very true. Uh, so you have a, a daunting task in front of you to try to to try to nurture uh, these businesses and create and support an environment where they can uh, survive and hopefully return to flourishing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Cohen and Commissioner Doris. Um, we'll now be moving to public testimony unless there are any other questions from council members. Um, I don't see any raised hands, so we'll move on um, to the next portion of our hearing. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once this has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I'll call on you after the panelists have completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Also a reminder to please submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I would now like to invite Mark Caserta from the NYC Bid Association to testify and he'll be followed by Lisa Soren and Camelia Tepolis. Mark, you may begin your testimony after the sergeant has called time. You may begin. Good morning, members of the New York City Council. My name is Mark Caserta, and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Bid Association. I'm also the exec executive director of the Park Slope Fifth Avenue Bid. Thank you, Chairs Jonai and Cohen for holding this hearing today. The Bid Association represents the 76 individual bids throughout the city that serve as stewards of our diverse commercial corridors and neighborhood public spaces. Our mission has always been to support the almost 100,000 local businesses we serve, to keep our neighborhoods clean and safe, and to bring prosperity to our communities. Never has our work been more vital and essential than it has been during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are pleased to present testimony today on the Open Storefronts program. The Bid Association began calling for a plan to help retailers, retail store fronts through the use of their frontage in April of this year in response to capacity limits and an increasing number of business closures. This policy proposal was included as one of our nine critical steps to save small business released in July of this year. This association put forward a formal proposal for an open stores program and sent it to the city in September. We are very glad that the administration ultimately enacted an open storefronts plan on October 30th, as it's an easy way to provide some relief for storefronts with no cost to taxpayers and little administrative burden for the city. However, early reports are that many storefronts are not taking advantage of the program for several reasons. First of all, we expect this program will take time to become widely utilized. 
It is late in the year and many stores have budget and staffing restrictions that may make them hesitant to sign up and implement major operational changes. Most stores have also never been granted an opportunity to use outdoor space and therefore do not have the same experience with such setups that restaurants have. We also believe that some stores are simply too busy and stressed to sign up or are concerned about being an early adopter who might be the target of enforcement actions. We are hopeful that more and more stores will use this initiative as the holiday shopping season begins. Many retail storefronts rely on the spike in revenue from holiday shopping, and we're hopeful that they will be able to survive into the new year. We are grateful for the mayor's partnership on this program, and particularly the support from SBS and Commissioner Doris, who we know have been very supportive of this initiative. However, we are, have several recommendations for how to improve the program. First of all, the program should be formally extended until at least capacity limits are lifted from storefronts. As we've seen through the open restaurants program, small businesses need to have confidence in programs in order to make the needed investments in them. Secondly, the city should conduct an education program to make sure that as many storefronts as possible are aware of the program. Not all small businesses have the benefit of a bid to help them. And lastly, we are strongly encourage the city to publicize program data similar to that of the open restaurants portal so that bids and shoppers alike can search for and find stores with open storefront outdoor options. Relatedly, we also hope that the city will expand the open restaurants and storefronts programs to allow for the use of adjacent frontage where appropriately authorized. It is our sincere the time has expired. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I just. I'm curious, uh, having a close, uh, a good working relationship with uh, with one of my bids in particular, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in the past, it's been a challenge to get uh, bid stores to not <laughs> uh, have their, their merchandise all over the street. Um, is, there, is there a tension there at all with some bids or some bids, uh, does this fit in better in some retail corridors than others? Is there... A, uh, I think it's yeah. It's it depends on the corridor. I was listening to uh, the other other council members about their concerns about crowded sidewalks. For example, mine. Uh, we have we have one official store that signed up for open storefronts. Um, there are maybe seven to ten more that have not yet done the paperwork uh, for various reasons. Um, we also have um, open rest stores, open streets restaurants that we closed nineteen blocks of our avenue on Saturdays. And we are finding more of the stores coming out into the streets uh, during those times. But there has been no, um, there have been no problems with uh, conflicts or uh, problems with restaurants and stores conflicting with one another. It's been pretty easy going. And but, but pre pandemic, were there issues where people were using the sidewalk as retail space, you know, in an unpermitted way? And was that a problem for the bid before? <laughs> Uh, no, it was not actually okay. not not in not in Park Slope. I I have heard in many other cases, and that certainly is a concern. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no raised hands from committee members, we'll move on to our next public witness, who's Lisa Sorin, and she'll be followed by Camelia Tepelis and then Kenya Abru. Um, Lisa, you may begin your testimony once the sergeant has called time. As well, um, Mark, if you can submit your written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov, we'd be interested to hear um, the rest of your recommendations. Thank you. Your time will begin now. Lisa, you're muted, Lisa. I get time back, right? Kidding. All right. For you, of course. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Cohen, Chairman Joe Nye, and council members. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning. My name is Lisa Soren, and I'm the president of the Bronx Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here to express my support and concerns about the Open Streets program. It is a well-intended program, and we are committed to assisting our small businesses that are interested in participating in the program anything that can help our businesses stay open, we absolutely support. Our concerns, to date I un understand there's only 500 businesses that have taken advantage of this program. We attribute this to various reasons. 
late notice of the approval of the program, the short timeline to use a program, which is ending December 31st, which makes it very difficult for businesses to take advantage, especially as it relates to weather. Yesterday's weather is a perfect example. Added to that stress, they do not have the experience with outdoor setups, budget, staffing restrictions, and worried about enforcement like there was against the restaurants. There is also a lack of engagement with philanthropic, sorry, philanthropy to build out unified storefront models that we saw during the open dining. The oversaturation of sidewalks, vendors, especially vendors setting up in front of vacant storefronts, which are adding up on a daily basis, restaurants, and unfortunately, vagrancy and homeless individuals that stay near the businesses to ask for money. As for the loan programs, which I know this is not part of it, but it's important. The storefront loan program is of a concern. I have minority businesses that are in desperate need to access this money. Unfortunately, the store falls under what's called the second phase of the loan distribution and is only if the money is available. I have one minority business that today was served with an eviction notice, but he is not eligible to apply for the loan until after December 13th. And again, only if there's money and no guarantee and meets all the criteria. Added to this, although not a city problem, but we need your help. <clears throat> we are facing the bankruptcy of many businesses faster than we have in the last nine months. As, as of right now, the PPP loans that are, are forgiven and given as grants now stop a business from doing their write-offs like payrolls, rent, et cetera. I have a business that received a 900,000 PPP loan that is facing a $400,000 tax bill. If our businesses continue this and we assisted so many businesses in applying for these PPP loans, those businesses that we helped will be going out of business by the beginning of the year. Thank you for the opportunity. Lisa, can I ask, uh, Has it's good to see you by the way and I appreciate you uh, Great to see you. Um, was there uh, outreach uh, to the chamber from SBS regarding this program? Um, there was. We actually had a meeting with, uh, you're talking about the open retail ones? Yes. There was, and we have it attempted to assist businesses. I have two specialists on the ground that are going out about 30 hours a week, encouraging businesses, but there's fear. More of the regulations, especially if they have restaurants that have been near them that have been shut down because of the regulations. They're fearful of what's coming their way and they can't afford any more fines or expenses that come with it. Yeah, I will say, I mean, and I, this is obviously anecdotal and I think that the experience uh, regarding restaurants initially, uh, there was a lot of, uh, as, as I you know, said in to, to the commissioner that there were, there were real issues with enforcement it does seem to be streamlined. I'm not getting those those kinds of complaints. Like I literally, I couldn't outdoor dine in the beginning because I would be flooded by the, the you know the restaurant owners and they would go get their friends to come and tell me you know, and and that seems to have abated. So for whatever it's that's worth. Now, Chairman Cohen, um, the problem that we're seeing now is the regulations that the city has put forth for winter um, outdoor dining, which is an added expense to our businesses with more permits. Like I said, the city is doing the best they can. I think that not everything is being put, um, the concerns aren't being addressed as needed. Um, so I think there needs to be more conversation. And my hope is that we have a warm winter, which would allow our businesses to do more business outdoors. So the December 31st date is just not gonna work for our businesses. Thank you, Lisa. Sarah, can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, Lisa, I didn't understand your point about the $900,000 <clears throat> PPP loan that was made where now it's a $400,000 uh, income reporting requirement. Is that what you were saying? That's correct. So when the PPP loan was released, and I know we're getting off subject, um, but we're going to be taking a strong stand on that. Um, so when the PPP was released, originally it was supposed to not impact the businesses. Once it turned into a grant, um, you during the tax season for businesses, they would be able to do their, their write-offs as they always do, payroll, rent, whatever all those write-off businesses do. As of right now, if your loan is turned into a grant, 
you are no longer of, allowed to do all those write-offs. And because you're not allowed to use those write-offs, you are looking at basically paying back part of your uh, grant in a tax form. So as an example, one of my businesses that received a $900,000 PPP loan, kept their employees working throughout the shutdown, now is facing a $400,000 um, tax bill unless it changes. So this would be a city, state, small business, anybody who can really just step it up because if that's the case, we have helped hundreds of businesses and um, with those tax bills, we're basically looking at a higher vacancy rate moving faster than it did in the last nine months. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Any other questions? Chairs? I'm good. Thank you, Lisa. We'll move on to our next witness, who is Camelia Tepelis, followed by Kenya Abru. Camelia, you may begin your testimony once the sergeant has called time. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Camelia Tepelus, and I'm the executive director of the Morris Park Business Improvement District since April 2019. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to address you this morning. Um, Bids and small businesses are grateful for your dedicated work exploring new, new ways to assist the city's small businesses struggling day by day to stay open, to continue providing jobs, and be of service to the New York City neighborhoods. Uh, the Morris Park Bids serves um, a solidly middle-class neighborhood if that feels like a small village. Um, over 300 businesses on 20 blocks on Morris Park Avenue in the Central Bronx. Morris Park being also the Bronx largest employment center, home to more than 23,000 jobs, representing 12% of all um, jobs. Um, the Morris Park Bid District fared fairly well, I would say atypically for the Bronx under the impact of COVID-19. We had two businesses closing, two relocated to lower rent spaces still within the district and 12 new businesses that opened over the last year, seven of which opened since mid-March. Inspection from New York City Planning on Morris Park Avenue found the corridor shockingly healthy and a Wall Street Journal art article from September 20 referring to independent third party food traffic data confirmed that food traffic in Morris Park Avenue uh, is basically back at pre-pandemic levels. Um, the open restaurants program was a big success on Morris Park Avenue and, um, and we are pleased that the city extended it year round. We feel that the open store storefronts program that was only made available on October 30 and foreseen to run until December 31st can make a similar positive contribution. Uh, our main message to the council is that the open source front program should be given a chance to be further tested beyond December 31st, uh, as um, the time frame that is currently running is a time frame with weather conditions often adverse to outdoor displays of merchandise over extended periods of time. Furthermore, uh, we consider that the city should um, initiate additional business awareness media campaigns on both open store fronts and open restaurants, including TV and social media components that would explain better the program so the thousands of New York City small businesses that are not members of merchants associations or bids. A very important point needs to be made about enforcement. Uh, currently, there is an alphabet soup of city agencies managing parts of this, this issue, yet nobody can give bids a clear answer if any enforcement can be effectively exercised concerning unauthorized street vending. Um, this effectively undermines viability of our brick and mortar storefronts. And one final point of observation, uh, we would suggest the city to provide the sort of visual signal like a window decal, which would not be on a window, but obviously- Time has expired. Okay. Camilla, you, you could finish. Okay, just one sentence. Um, from the consumer's point of view, it can be very confusing to make the distinction between a small business that appropriately serve certified through the open source front program and an illegal vendor, both occupying the sidewalk. And we would suggest the city provides a visual form of recognition like those window decals that restaurants have um, to signal that a particular business is in fact authorized to occupy and conduct business on the public um, sidewalk. 
Um, also, we just want to say, while we express support for the extension of the open source front program, we also acknowledge it is only one tool within a larger, more diversified toolbox of measure that the city, state, and federal government need to continue deploying to assist um, our small businesses. By themselves, these programs, open storefronts, along with open restaurants, are only parts of what should be a more coordinated and comprehensive approach from the city, the state, and federal government um, to include better access to grants, loan skilled workforce, less red tape, and simplified permitting um, processes. We thank you very much to the entire, um, to both committees for organizing this hearing. Um, uh, we appreciated that in very first, in the opening statement of both Chair Cohen and Chair Jonai, the points of enforcement, the points of weather, the points of time frames, the points of why wasn't this done earlier were addressed, but we also acknowledge the hard work of our um, oversight agencies, the New York City Department of Small Businesses that really went at great length in uh, pushing out uh, these innovative new programs. Thank you. I'm not good at cutting off constituents, everybody. So just <laughs> <laughs> thank you for testifying. Uh, Camelia, thank you for that excellent point. We should look into this chair on how we can decipher who is part of the open streets program versus an illegal vendor uh, that we may not, we may assume is part of the expansion of the open streets program. Uh, I just don't I know if we'll be able point. to get something in place before the end of the year and if this program is going to continue. But excellent point, Camelia. Thank you. Thank you, Camelia. As I see no additional questions, we'll move on to our next witness, Kenya Abru. You can begin your testimony after the sergeant has called. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you, um, Council Member Chair um, Joe and I and Cohen for this opportunity to testify today. Um, so, you know, we have been a partner of the city of New York for many years in providing services to small businesses. And since the pandemic, we have been um, working very closely with them. Um, in June, we started to visit the businesses throughout the city to um, assess their need and provide the um, services for um, the reopening and the recovery. And one of the things I wanna say is that um, also the city comes up with these great initiatives, one of the, um, like the store, um, the open um, storefront. One of the things that we really want to advise the city is to convey some of the small businesses um, to a round table to really hear what the needs are. Because one of the things that happens a lot of times is that although organizations are called to the table, um, not very often the businesses that are really affected are called to the table to hear them out. And that's one of the, the, the things that happens with the storefront, for instance, um, when it comes to the concerns, some of the ones already expressed, um, we um, did not have them, as many of them as the table as we should have. And um, talking to them, I can tell you that many did not get the information. Um, a lot of the store uh, fronts don't even know about this initiative. And what I advise um, Department of Small Business Services is to um, not only talk to the borough chambers, but also bring in uh, the other chambers of commerce, like the New York Women's Chamber, um, and the other organizations that work with the businesses. There are a lot of organizations that are working with the businesses, providing assistance with um, the loans, the grants, um, the regulations, everything. And we are right there talking to them all the time. So it makes sense that the Department of Business, Small Business Services call in, um, those organizations to also help with promoting these initiatives that are so important that can really help um, the businesses. We want to see the, um, the initiative um, expanded, um, Council Member Joe and I, to um, um, until this pandemic is under control. Um, this, you know, the small businesses are suffering a lot. Um, I, I talked to the store um, owners, to um, the beauty salons, to the restaurant owners, and anything that we can do needs to be done. So right now we need to expand the initiative. We need to promote it more so the businesses know that this is around. And also we need to include all the organizations that are working with the businesses for them to let them know and also help them with the process. Um, I know that they spoke about the um, 
the sidewalk, and I'll tell you this, um, the sidewalk, the businesses are responsible for the sidewalks so that in terms of cleaning, in terms of making sure that it's safe. The time has expired. So that's important in that sense that to take that into consideration too, that the business are responsible for the sidewalk and they should have the first bid as using the sidewalk for their business. Thank you, Kenya. Any, qu any questions, chairs? I'm good, thank you. Kenya, I wanna thank you for being here and that's another great point. You heard the debate back and forth that that sidewalk uh, entitlement should first be to the storefront adjacent mm -hmm. to the, uh, the, the sidewalk before this becomes a first come first serve who got their first uh, argument. We have a lot of work to do, thank you. Thank you, Chairs. At this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands, I'll turn it over to the chairs for closing remarks. Chair Cohen, um, Chair Jonai, would you like to make closing remarks? I'll let the uh, senior colleague go first. He's older than I am. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Chair. Uh, I really just want to, uh, A, thank everybody who testified. I think it is clear that there are a myriad of issues facing our retailers uh, that are COVID related and also beyond COVID related. Uh, I do applaud the administration, I think, for looking for creative solutions to try to support our businesses. I think that there's a lot, you know, I think this hearing has made clear that there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, but I, I do want to, uh, I, I think that we need to acknowledge the work that has been done. And again, I do want to also acknowledge the work of the council staff. Uh, putting these hearings together is very challenging. It's uh, more labor intensive than actually meeting live. So uh, I'm grateful for all the work that's uh, gone into uh, making this hearing. I don't know if we, did we acknowledge council member Levin? Cause I see council member Levin is on. Uh, and I want, again, I want to thank all the staff. Council Member Joni. Thank you, Chair Cohen. And again, thank you for allowing me to co-chair this important hearing with you. I want to thank all of those that participated. Uh, many more have submitted their testimonies in writing that could not be a part of this. But these hearings are important for this very reason. We get to hear directly from you on things that we may not be aware of. Some of the quick points that were brought up today and some of the issues, whether it be the tax the grant uh, tax implications to the suggestion of, that Camilla brought up uh, of uh, making sure that we differentiate between the storefront open program and an illegal street vendor or a legal street vendor. We shouldn't make an assumption. And the uh, point that Kenya uh, supported again that was made earlier uh, about uh, who gets there first and who should have the right of first refusal to the sidewalk adjacent to their property. I want to thank you all. Please help us shape and make a better policy and programs. Nothing is perfect, but as long as we keep trying and improving on what we have, we continue to make a difference. Thank you all and God bless you. All right. Thank you very much. This uh, concludes uh, this uh, joint uh, committee hearing of Consumer Affairs and Small Business.